This morning we're going to continue our study in the book of Romans, and we are at chapter 15, and I think over the next three or four Sundays we will finish up the book of Romans, and it's been a, it's been a good study, um, certainly a lot of strong doctrine we've talked about and learned in this book, um, but this morning, the beginning of chapter 15, the first 13 verses are a continuation of a call to unity that we studied about in chapter 14, where we established uh, two different types of Christians. Paul calls them the strong Christian and the weak Christian, but we found out that we don't necessarily uh, need to put the attachment or meaning of strong or weak as we understand it, but rather that the strong Christian is one who is comfortable in his Christian liberties and the weak Christian is one who isn't as strong in liberties. And so call, Paul calls uh, for unity between the two types of Christians. And I think that the reason he does so is when he's writing to the Roman church, he has Jewish converts and Gentile converts. And the Jews would probably be the ones that, that Paul would uh, call the, the strong Christian and the Gentiles would be the weak. And so we, we must understand that um, these two terms were used particularly about a particular church that Paul wrote about in first century Palestine. But we need to apply the idea of unity to the broader church of Christ throughout the world. We have so many brothers and sisters in Christ just in this community alone that we need to find ways to be in harmony with them, to find unity with them. And so oftentimes we, we find fault or we find that their doctrine isn't the same as ours. And there are elements that we cannot concede on, such as the uh, headship of Christ over the church, the fact that he died and resurrected from the dead, and, and that he is, he is God in the flesh. We cannot concede on any of those things. But there are other areas in uh, modes of worship, the way we partake in communion, that we don't do the same as other churches do, or they don't, or, or they don't do the same as we do, depending on how you want to look at it. And, and we need not let those things get in the road or be a stumbling block for one another when we, when we get along. Christians need to be able to agree to disagree. It's very important. If we can't agree to disagree on some topics, we're going to be at odds with one another. And that is not why Christ died. Christ died for unity among Christians. He died for the repentance or for the forgiveness of, of sin of man. Not just the mankind of the church of Christ or not just the man of the First Baptist Church, but for all that would place their faith in him. So we're going to read chapter 15 together. Um, it's not that long, and then we'll go back and we're going to talk this morning about the first 13 verses, and then next week we'll finish chapter 15 and start into chapter 16. I'd like to get it wrapped up in three sermons, and I think we can probably do that. Paul writes, We who are strong, and notice how Paul identifies himself with the strong Christian ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, but as it is written, the results of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. 
For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and, moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let the peoples extol him. Again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with the knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I said and done, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way to Aril Elicrium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have been hindered from coming to you. But now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I have been longing to visit many years to, since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. And I hope you while passing through, I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in service of the Lord's people. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings. They owe it to the Jew to share with them their material blessings. So after I've, so after I've completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessings of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea, and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there, so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The peace of God be with you all. Amen. So I'm amazed at the letter written by Paul. I mean, as strong as it's been in doctrine, this is a very personal part of his letter to the church. He, he's even asking the church to pray for him as he comes into Jerusalem with this offering that he has is carrying from the, uh, the church in Macedonia. And we'll talk about that more later. But he, he start, starts off with a, a strong admonition. He says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. To bear with someone 
is more than just to tolerate them. When you, when you are bearing with someone that you might not necessarily agree with, you're not just putting up with them. You are helping them along even. Even though you don't agree with them, you're helping them along and you're doing this, Paul says in verse 2, not to please yourself, to make yourself feel good about yourself. You know, we, we can help others along that we don't necessarily agree with. We can be their cheerleader and, and we do it because we want to uh, make ourselves feel good, like we've done some good deed. But Paul says that's not to be um, the reason that you do this. You're to do it to build them up. You're to be genuine. You're not to be. You're not to be fake in your in your in your in your help of them. And he and he says Christ even did not please himself, but it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Now the you in chat in verse three is God. I don't know why it's not capitalized here. It is in my in my uh, Bible. Uh, but the insults of those who insult you, capital U, have fallen on me. Christ was, was suffering for the sake of God. And, and many people were insulting God, and in doing so, they were insulting Christ. Christ did not please himself. He came to do the will of the Father. His whole ministry was about others. It was about doing God's will. We never read in the Bible about Jesus taking care of himself, do we? We never read about him laughing. Um, all we ever read about Jesus doing is helping others and teaching. And of course, giving up his life. But he was always about his father's will. Um, his dying was because of his father's will. Jesus even asked God, if there be another way, could this, could this cup pass from me? But your will be done. And so even in his death and suffering, Jesus did not please himself, but did his father's will. <coughs> I wanted to read you something from William Hendrickson on this verse. The main reason Paul is conveying this, if Christ, the Holy One, the Holy One of God, if Christ was willing to take on himself so much suffering in the form of insults hurled upon him by his enemies, should we not be willing to sacrifice just a little bit of eating and drinking pleasure for the sake of fellow believers. Think about that. If Christ was willing to take all of that suffering for our sake, shouldn't we be willing to put up with a little bit of indifference among our fellow believers? Of course we should. Think of the indifference that we have between God because of our actions and our attitudes and our and our thoughts. The, the darkness of our hearts, God puts up with us even though we aren't necessarily following his direction all the time. We, we fall short. We miss the mark. We sin. Yet he puts up with us. And not only that, he put in place the way that we could be in his presence even though we are sinful. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. Now the quotation... Uh, that is written in verse 3, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me comes from Psalm 69. And the implied lesson is that the strong believers of the new dispensation should be filled with zeal. The strong believers should be eager to make sacrifices for the sake of of not only their weak fellow believers, but also, and for most of all, for God. 
they should strive to promote, to promote his glory. Now, I want to ask you, don't answer out loud, but as congregants of the Church of Christ, do you consider yourself a strong believer or a weak believer? Not defined on the amount of faith you have, but on these areas of liberties that we've been talking about. Okay, And, and consider that when you're dealing with believers from other churches or new believers. <clears throat> so to follow up that quote from Psalm 69, Paul says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. William Hendrickson says this is a very practical an unforgettable passage. In brief, it informs us that if religion is going to mean anything, we must practice it. We must practice our religion. Uh, whatever was written in the scriptures, which was what Paul meant in uh, what we now call the Old Testament, was written for our instruction. I mean, I know it's hard to, to read a lot of the Old Testament because so much of it is, is written in a form that uh, is difficult for us to understand and follow. But the Old Testament, especially if you think about the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books of the law, the, those books were uh, fundamental in who the nation of Israel was and why God chose individuals and why God people chose the Jewish nation. And we can look at that and understand the relationship that we now have with God uh, vicariously through the relationship that he had with the patriarchs of the Old Testament and the promises and the covenants that he made with them. Those, those are still good, and we can depend on God to keep his word and to keep his covenants. The apostle is addressing the membership of the Roman church in verses 5 and 6, and all the others who then would later be acquainted with the contents of the epistle, utters this solemn prayer wish that though the practical and devotional use of scriptures the addressed being made the recipients of the affirmation to Precious blessings may reach the goal of living in harmony with one another. Paul says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul calls, Paul calls for a spirit of unity among yourselves. Not that believers should all come to the same conclusions, because we won't. Not even in this congregation are we going to come to the same conclusions about what's presented in Scripture. Now, a lot of it we will, but conclusions on matters of conscience discussed above that we might be able to agree to disagree in love for one another. That's the, that's the bottom line. We need to be able to agree to disagree with others that don't share our opinion. Now, there are some things we've talked about in the Bible that are black and white. And, and the things that we're talking about, these issues of difference, aren't sin issues. They're liberty issues. We, we are not to use liberty to condone sin in any way, in our own lives or in other people's lives. We cannot do that. That's not what Scripture was intended for. And that's not what we're to do in faith to justify uh, our sins. Paul flats out says in verse 7, Accept one another then. Accept one another. Just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. We are to accept one another just as Christ accepted us. You ever think about your life? And I think about mine, I think, you know, what a mess I've made of some things. 
And yet, I have faith that Christ loves me, even though I have made a mess of my life in so many areas. Christ loves me bes beside what I have done. He forgives me for those things. And if, if Christ accepts me, then I ought to accept the other person. Paul says, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant to the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might become confirmed, and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. I want to read to you what Hendrickson says about, about this. Verses nine or eight and nine indicate that not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, Christ has become and continues to become a servant. It was to the Jews that Jesus first made his ministry public. Remember, he, he, he went to the Jews and he ministered them, he healed to them, he taught them. And then he uh, rendered humble, personal service to them. And he died for them. He did this in order to confirm God's truth, his reliability, his faithfulness to the covenant promise, the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ confirmed the promise by again and again causing it to be realized in the hearts and lives. God originally established his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of Israel, all of them Jews. Nevertheless, God's mercy extended also to the Gentiles, in fact, to the ends of the earth. So in connection with the work of Christ for Israel, it is especially God's truth, his covenant faithfulness, that stands out in connection with his work among the Gentiles. It is predominantly his comprehensive, condescending mercy that shines forth. So it started with the Jews, and then it continued on with the Gentiles so that they might give glory to God. And then he quotes several Old Testament verses. The first one, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will praise your name. That first quotation is from Psalm 1849, and the psalmist states that he will declare his name among the Gentiles. So it's prophetic. Back in the time that it was written, it was prophetic that God would pray, that the Gentiles would praise his name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with all his people. Now that comes from Deuteron Deuteronomy 32, 43. And the Gentiles are summoned to join in praising God. And then the third verse, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. That comes from Psalm 117, 1. And the Gentiles are called upon independently to praise God. And then the fourth, the root of Jesse, and you need to remember um, Jesse was David's father. The root of Jesse will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations, and him the Gentiles with, will hope. And that comes from Isaiah 11.10. And the attention is focused upon the shoot capital S shoot, that being Jesus, the root of Jesse, who will rule over the Gentiles and in whom they will all hope. He is the one from whom the promises made to the fathers would remain unfulfilled and without whom the Gentiles would never be able to glorify God. If Jesus didn't fulfill these scriptures, the Gentiles would never have come to have any hope in God. They were, they were never God's chosen people. Israel were. The Gentiles were grafted in. So the very last verse this morning, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice that hope is used twice in that verse. Remember 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, it says, for these three there's hope or there is faith, hope, and love. Of course, the greatest of those is love. But hope is included in that. Hope uh, does not indicate a weak aspiration, but a firmly rooted expectation. What is the hope that we have in God? The hope is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And this is the, this is the most important hope we can have. It, it's so hard for us to visualize our life beyond the now or even the short or distant future. We, we just don't visualize what life after this life will be like. But we know that we have descriptions of what heaven will be like, what paradise will be like, and we have the promise of that, and that promise is founded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Christ rose from the dead, something that no other person has ever done, Granted, Christ was fully man and fully God, but he rose from the dead and we can have promise in the hope that he will restore us to everlasting life with him in heaven. This world is full of hopelessness. It's full of hopelessness. Wendy has been working census and she's had to go out and verify addresses. And I already knew this to be true because I've driven the school bus. But you don't have to fight, drive very far in Putnam County and just look at homes and question whether people live there or not. And it turns out they do. This community, this country, this world is full of hopelessness. Hope exists in the body of Christ. And we have a great responsibility to tell the world that there is hope found in Christ. All these people that are living in hopelessness need to hear the power of the gospel. And they're not going to hear that if the church doesn't tell them. that. That's the only reason... Christ has not returned yet, folks, is because we have a job to do. We have the great commission to fulfill. We're to go and make disciples. So I want to encourage you this morning with this challenge. Many of you, like me, are so confident in the hope of Christ that you don't give it a second thought. It's part of who you are. It's how you were raised. It's how you live your life. It's how you're going to continue life until you die. With the knowledge that the promises made by God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ will come true for each one of us. And we, we don't even dwell upon it. It's just fact. Now, I want you to take a minute or just a second to think about what your life would be like without that knowledge. There are all kinds of people in this community that don't have that factual knowledge that you can share with them. They may be your friend, they may be your acquaintance, they may be your coworker, they may be somebody that you see when you go to High V on Tuesday. I don't know. But we need to be open with our faith and ready to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because that's the job he's left us to do. Let's pray together. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in the promises of Scripture. We pray, Father, that we might be a beacon of light in our community, that we might be able to share the hope we have in Christ with someone this week. I pray, Father, for each one of us 
that we would have an opportunity to encounter someone to share our faith with. I don't think we pray that very often, Lord, and it should be the focal point of our prayers that we get the opportunity to share our faith. It's the very reason we're here on this earth. It's the very reason that you created us. It's the very reason that you brought us up in the church so that we could share our faith. Everything else in our life is a blessing, but it's secondary. It's secondary to what we've been charged with. And I know, Father, it's much easier for me to stand behind the pulpit and extol this challenge than for me actually to go out and share my faith. But that's what I need to do. And that's what we all need to do. So give us courage. Give us the words. And Father, give us determination so that we can do this. I thank you, Father, for everyone that's here. I just want to thank you especially, Father, for bringing Linda here this morning. Uh, so good to see her uh, getting better. And Father, it's been a long journey for her, and I just pray that you would continue to bless she and Ronnie as they continue to work through rehab and uh, getting Linda fully back on her feet. Father, bless Leo and Mark as uh, they reside in a care center. I just pray, Father, that, that each day they would feel blessed and they would feel your presence. They would feel the warmth of your encouragement. Thank you, Father, for all of those that care for them. Father, guard, guard our hearts and minds now as we go into this time of communion. I just pray, Lord, that we would be able to focus upon the cross, focus upon the suffering and the pain, the torture that Jesus incurred on our behalf, that he was willing to take all of that so that we might be forgiven of our sins and be able to be with you in eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.